Welcome to the LSU Sports Insider, brought to you by the journalists at The Advocate, NOLA.com and The Times Picayune. My name is Perrin Keyes. I'm the executive sports editor. Joined today by Wilson Alexander and Reed Darcy, two of our LSU beat writers extraordinaire. Gentlemen, how are you guys doing today? Doing well. Finally finished getting my Christmas tree up yesterday because it's the first time that I ever had like a tree this size uh, in my wife's house. Now that we're living there, it's 10 feet tall, maybe even 11. And so it took, a, few, it, took a, it took a couple of days of is figuring it, out how many lights I needed. Is it a real tree? Oh, yeah. Oh, wow. well, always a real tree. Okay, so I'm well, doing so, well. That's the latest thing. In no, 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 no. Let's get let's let's get the hot takes out of the way first. Real or artificial? Is it is artificial? Uh, OK, uh, right. we no, it's absolutely not. My parents had a real tree for a long time and then they bit the bullet and got a fake one. So I, I actually very much like I love Christmas. It's my favorite holiday, and I'm I'm personally responsible for all the lights, all the decoration. Nobody nobody else is allowed to touch it. But for 30 years now, I've put up a fake tree. So that's that's sort of become a weird backward tradition of mine. So we're going to end the podcast. I have to leave. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> yes. Well, we're we're nothing if not anyway. uh, if not disagreeable people. Uh, we are here obviously to discuss LSU's. Uh, Upcoming bowl game or potential bowl destinations. We're here to discuss, obviously, Jason Jaden Daniels' uh, Heisman pursuit. And we're here to discuss uh, some offseason changes, uh, whether it's uh, via coaching staff or personnel or something of that nature. But first things first, first and foremost, we're going to discuss Angel Reese. Angel Reese is back as of uh, in, right now, which is midday Thursday. Uh, we are awaiting, uh, we will await tip off. Uh, between LSU and Virginia Tech at 8 o'clock in the PMAC on Thursday night on ESPN. So we will get into all that. But as as per usual, a bit of business first. Uh, if you're listening you uh, or tuning in, you know that uh, the Advocate's always been the number one destination for LSU sports coverage. This podcast is just another great way for us to bring that coverage to you. To uh, subscribe to The Advocate, please go to theadvocate.com slash subscribe. To get a hold of our LSU newsletter, uh, that's a daily newsletter. You can uh, stay up to date on everything, all sports, all LSU sports. You go to theadvocate.com slash LSU newsletter. Uh, this po- this fine podcast is available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever other finer podcasts are found. Uh, and also, but more, more specifically, uh, honestly, uh, please uh, please follow us along on our YouTube channel, LSU Tigers at NOLA.com on YouTube. We are there live every Monday and Thursday. Uh, but if you don't catch us live, you can catch us uh, at any time on that uh, on that YouTube channel. So please subscribe to that. Uh, and uh, you know, if you uh, if you are in the gift giving mood, which you should be, obviously we're discussing Christmas here. Uh, you should uh, you should maybe get a hold of uh, some LSU championship posters, Advocate front page posters that, of course, are iconic uh, here in South Louisiana and have been for thirty odd years ever since. LSU won their first uh, national championship in baseball in 1991. All of those posters are available at store. Dot the advocate.com. Again, that's store.theadvocate.com. And if you enter the coupon code INSIDER, you can get 15% off your purchase. So uh, consider that as you are doing some shopping and ideally not having to hustle around to the mall like we all used to have to do for years and years and years and years. So uh, we are brought to you uh, today and every day by Champion Wealth Strategies. Champion Wealth Strategies is a national financial services firm specializing in the capital markets, securities, insurance, 401ks, and college and retirement planning. Our broker-dealer is LPL Financial Member FINRA, SICP, SIPC, excuse me. And as you know, uh, investments are not FDIC insured, may lose value, and have no bank guarantee. To learn more, ch- contact Champion Wealth Strategies at Champion Wealth Strategies and plan like a champion today. Uh, so, uh, uh, again, this is, uh, we are here on midday Thursday. And uh, of course, we that means we're about, uh, well, we're less than 24 hours removed from uh, one of the more Extraordinary, compelling, interesting, odd, and sometimes combative press conferences that I think uh, any of us has ever seen, frankly. Uh, we, we are not totally surprised that Angel Reese is back and that Angel Reese was back in time for this game. This is easily LSU's uh, toughest non-conference game, I think, of the season. Uh, these two teams obviously met in the national semifinals last year. LSU had to rally and come back and, uh, and win in the second half. Um, and on this fine podcast on Monday, uh, Rab sort of surmised or uh, predicted that LSU, that uh, LSU would bring back Angel uh, before this game. So that's not necessarily a surprise, but um, 
maybe surprised and only sort of the way it was handled. I, I don't know. 17 points, uh, averaging 17 points and 10.3 rebounds uh, in her first four games and LSU's first four games this season. And now she's back. And, and LSU, frankly, sorely needed to read. I'll just sort of let you uh, go wherever you want to go with this to start off. Well, I think it's important to note that um, I think the first place to start would be Samaya Smith and her injury. Yeah. And just, you know, we feel, we feel terrible for her. And, you know, she tore her ACL and her MCL and her meniscus last Friday. Um, and, and LSU's went over Niagara and the Cayman Islands. I think that's a huge deal. And it, 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 it couldn't be better timing for LSU to have Angel Reese back um, right when they lose her because they really need her against Virginia Tech, especially defensively. Losing all that size um, that that Samaya Smith gave you, and all that rim protection that that they that she gave you. So I, I think you know Angel, she was gone for about what was it, sixteen days or something. Mm -hmm. It's only two weeks. It felt like t two seasons, <laughs> you know, since, <laughs> since then. But but I guess on her, we, we probably we don't know why she was away from the team. Um, if we do ever find out, it won't be anytime soon. So I I think it's it's good to have her back and have her back in an LSU uniform playing basketball. And all the questions that Kim Mulkey gets right now can be about basketball and not about stuff off the court. So I think I think everybody's looking forward to sort of getting back to basketball now. In all likelihood, she will probably get a, a couple of extra rounds of questions on this. And she said that she would bring Angel uh, out to uh, to speak to us in post games, so that will be uh, you know yet another uh, compelling press conference. So a Angel uh, Angel had averaged twenty three point zero points, four, excuse me, fifteen point four rebounds per game last year in thirty six games. 34, 34 of those games, if I'm not mistaken, were double doubles. That was a uh, a national NCAA record. You know, listen, her reputation is well earned on the floor, um, and it comes at a time. Her return comes at a time when they're going to uh, face Virginia Tech. Elizabeth Kitley, we all saw her last year. She's averaging 24 points per game uh, for the Hokies. And so this is going to be, you know, LSU was always in in some ways, I don't want to put words in your in your, in your your mouth, Reed, you may disagree, but LSU in some ways was always going to sort of be challenged uh, in the front court uh, just from the from the standpoint of numbers, maybe a depth, particularly with the the absence of Samaya, uh, Samaya Smith, and we'll get into that a little bit. But just uh, tell us tell us take stock of the of LSU's front court specifically as we uh, as we not only get into December, but then later on a conference play before Virginia Tech. Well, you lost Ladesha Williams from last year, right? And I think LSU felt that loss pretty early on in the season when when they played Colorado. Colorado did a great job in the paint. They did a great job with their post players. Aaronette Vonley um, was awesome, super efficient around the rim. They couldn't really defend her. They didn't really have a way to guard her. They started Angel Reese in that game alongside Anissa Morrow. And then after that game, when they struggled to defend the paint so much, they brought in Samaya Smith to the starting lineup to have more size. And I think that paid off for them defensively. Now you don't have Samaya Smith, so you're probably going to have to bring Angel Reese and Anissa Morrow back to the front court. And again... Angel is going to have to be that rim protector now because Aaliyah Del Rosario, she's a freshman. She's six foot six. She may one day get to a point where you can trust her to defend the rim like that. But I don't know if she's ready to be thrust into that position um, so soon in her career. So they're going to have to ask a lot defensively of Angel Reese in addition to all the responsibility she has offensively and, and the way they need her to crash the boards and get offensive rebounds. Um, so tonight I'll be watching just exactly how Angel you know, defends Elizabeth Kitley and defends those pick and rolls with Georgia Amor, their, their star point guard. Um, last year, Alexis Morris and Ladisha Williams, they did a really good job against those two. Um, you know, Amor sort of, when, when they had screen and roll actions with um, Kitley, Alexis Morris would go over the screen, follow her from behind, and Ladisha Williams would be right there, um, sort of like cutting off that driving lane while also keeping an eye on Kitley on the roll. And that's, that's easier said than done. It's a really difficult assignment, and... Um, I think Angel Reese is absolutely capable of filling that role that Alicia Williams did defensively. Um, but but again, it, it's it's a lot to ask of somebody to do all that on the offensive end and to anchor your defense um, on on the other end of the floor. So I'll you know I'll be I'll be watching to see just exactly how she looks tonight defensively and and what positions that LSU puts her in. In light of Samaya Smith's absence, I don't expect this to happen in this game because this is a huge stage against some very gifted, very veteran players in Virginia Tech. Might you suspect, uh, and I'm genuinely asking because I don't know, but might might we suspect that we would see, we will see more of Del Rosario maybe than we 
than we thought we might, given given yes. the nature of the injuries. Yeah, I think so. I don't think she'll start right away, um, but I do think she'll get more minutes off the bench, especially especially without Samaya Smith, because um, again, I think Kim Mulkey really really values size. Um, she told us earlier in the season it, it was a good quote. She said. When I'm dead and gone, write about how much I love defense and rebounding and how my teams <laughs> lo- love to defend and rebound. And so she really values size. She likes to play two traditional post players um, in the front court at the same time, sort of, you know, two players who are taller than six foot two, six foot three. She really liked doing that. Um, and, and now, you know, you lost Ladisha Williams last year. And now you don't have Samaya Smith. So um, they're going to need to rely on Aaliyah Del Rosario a lot more than they were expecting to. And um, and she's going to have to you know, be ready. You know, she, her, her de- development curve is going to have to be accelerated a little bit. Speaking of absences, uh, LSU is without at the moment and possibly indefinitely, possibly forever, without Kateri Poole. Kateri Poole uh, mostly came off the bench last year but then became sort of a surprise starter in the postseason as LSU sort of made that magical run, and she... Uh, is not with the team, as Kim Mulkey put it. Make of that what you will, but Reed, I'll just sort of let you reset that whole situation. So like Angel, we, we don't know why Kateri Poole is not with the team. Kim Mulkey didn't want to elaborate when she was sort of pressed on it yesterday. Um, so, so we won't speculate. Again, same thing I did with Angel. It's best just like lay out the facts. All right, so this all started November 14th against Kent State. Right. Um, Angel started that game. Kateri did not. Um, she didn't play at all in that game. And Kim Mulkey was asked sort of, hey, wh- why didn't we see both of them play? The question was, you know, lumped Angel and Kateri in the same question. She called it a coach's decision. So fast forward later that week, that was a Tuesday. Friday of that week, they go to Hammond to play Southeastern. Angel's not there, but Kateri is there. She's back with the team in uniform. She ends up playing in only about five minutes, but she does play. So that was a Friday. Monday after that, Texas Southern She's dressed out, she's in uniform, she's on the bench, but she's only the only Tiger who did not play in that game. You know, the that was a game they won by 50, walk-ons played, all that. She didn't suit up. And then LSU makes a trip to the Cayman Islands to play two games against Niagara and Virginia. She didn't make the trip along with Angel, and Kim Mulkey was, was asked sort of, you know, you know, why didn't she make the trip? What's her status with the team? And, and she said she'll update um, her status when... LSU gets back in Baton Rouge, and so that was yesterday, and she says she's not currently with the team, and she declined to say if or when she'll be back with the team um, at some point this season, and so we, we don't know um, what, what her status is going forward, and it's it's another big loss defensively because that's, that's her strong suit. She's right. um, a tough physical perimeter defender, and she can also hit a few threes on the offensive end. Um, so, it, so it, again, it's a big loss, one that hurts LSU's defense. I actually have a question for you, parents. Yeah. Did, not to derail us necessarily, but it just kind of was floating in my mind because of how you described it, you know yesterday's press conference and everything like that. And I've seen some questions about this. What What do you think Kim Mulkey owes people in terms of explanations about Pool and about Angel Reese? So I I happen to th- listen. I'll put it to you like this, Wilson. And it's a good question. I'm glad I'm glad we're bringing it up. Um, I. Th- it, First of all, Kim's right. She's basically never turned down, you know, an interview, declined to speak to us locally. Uh, She uh, takes issue, I think, with um, pointed questions, difficult questions, and and or criticism. But I I would say that generally speaking, these questions aren't necessarily out of bounds. Uh, You know, you... There was a there was a debate for a long time about how much uh, how much college players should be open to criticism and how how difficult that criticism should be. I don't even know necessarily that anybody is anybody in the media anyway, the local media is criticizing Angel Reese because frankly we just don't know enough about what's happened uh, behind the scenes. We've you know we've heard stuff, but it doesn't necessarily mean we've we know it to be 100 percent true. Um, I think, though, that uh, the notion where Kim says, hey, uh, you guys aren't entitled to know. Well, no, these are public figures. There is there is a different standard when it comes to public figures than it is to, than, than there is to private citizens. Uh, you know, she's Kim appreciates and respects and wants good media coverage and a lot of media coverage. But 
listen, media coverage is not cheerleader coverage. It's also there to say, hey, wait a minute, this is this is an all-American here who's just sort of disappeared with no explanation. Now she's got every right to say, hey, I, I'm not going to explain it to you. We've got every right to continue asking, and that I think is what we've done. And I don't I don't know that it's been irresponsible. Um, I would say that it's been fair. And sh listen, she's got a right to answer that question however she chooses to answer it. So. Um, that, that's where we stand, but I don't, I don't, I don't know that anything that uh, any of us has done has been particularly out of bounds. I don't know that we've been harsh in our criticism of of either side of this because, again, we just we don't know one hundred percent all the way what's been what's what has transpired behind the scenes, what hasn't. So, yeah, and I think um, you know to go off on that, I think we're sort of in uncharted territory in terms of college sports and mm -hmm. the state state of sports. There's never been a women's college basketball player like Angel Reese before. And Kim Mulkey has never coached an Angel Reese type of player before where um, her celebrity and her overall status is as large. And her income level. Her income level is as large as it is. So I was going to say, I feel like Brittany Griner would have had name recognition, but not necessarily. Obviously, that was pre-NIL. So pre-NIL, like, yeah. you know, pre, pre all, everything that has changed social media. That was, you know, it wasn't as big as it is today. So... Um, so Kim with Angel, she's sort of taken the same approach that she's taken throughout the rest of her career. Um, you know, Kim, Kim's an old school coach. She's uh, stubborn in, in all the best ways. Um, so it's like she's sort of taken that old school approach to handling these sorts of things into this new modern era of college sports. Um, and I think that's sort of where some of the friction um, has sort of originated because um, she's got... An old, an old school mentality brushing up against a brand new media landscape, brand new landscape of college athletics. So we're, we're again, we're sort of in uncharted waters here, and and I think that's sort of where a lot of the friction came about. It was interesting, like hearing some of the, seeing some of the clips from Kim's press conference yesterday. In contrast to another press conference, this, it doesn't relate at all necessarily, but like you're talking about with college athletes in particular, Louisville basketball plays a game last night. <laughs> And the head coach is asked about the absence of a player and just comes out and says, like, he didn't want to wear the tights that we have never had for him anyway and was very blunt and transparent about the whole thing. And I'm, it made me think, like, well, would you want Kim to be very open and transparent about what she, whatever was going on with Angel or, you know, be doing something that does kind of, it's kind of protecting her. From, right. And mo probably, you know, I mean, it's, it feels That's, protective. And, no. I, and I think that that is not a bad quality for her to have as a coach because that is kind of your job, especially in college, is to protect your players as much as you can and when the situation is appropriate to do so. And so, and like you said, college athletes, there are still a lot of legal like protections for them that don't exist in professional sports. Sometimes it gets twisted a little bit too far. Right. Um, and with information is withheld when it shouldn't be simply because of uh, and they claim, you know, laws and that kind of thing. But colleges do have to abide by certain rules that you don't in professional sports. Kim's Kim's uh, explanation for some of these things is, well, you know, as a matter of fact, she said she's protecting her player uh, and obviously well within well within her right to do so. She her her one of her sort of blanket responses is, that, well, no matter what I say, I'm going to get criticized for it. Well, OK, you're getting criticized now anyway. So you may I, I've always sort of been not that anybody asked me for PR advice, but I was always sort of the opinion that maybe the best if it were me handling handling this matter, I probably would have said something to the effect of, hey, look, uh, you know, I'm not going to you guys already know that I'm not going to tell you everything. Speaking in Kim's voice here, you guys yep. know that I'm not going to tell you everything. But look, we all remember what it was like to be 21 at one point in our lives. And, you know, young people are going to make mistakes and we're working through things. But that's part of the life and that's part of the team. And that's part of the natural course of the season and things we handle as coaches. Now, she did say some of that stuff, you know, hey, this is what we do as coaches and this is what we handle as coaches and everything. The notion, though, they will have, hey, we're already past it. And we're tired of asking questions, answering questions about it. Yeah, that, yeah that's, that's too bad. Nobody's <laughs> nobody's already passed it. Nobody within the team has already passed it. This is not. This still, is not something. This is an lot, all American here. A lot more questions than answers. That's right correct. Now. That's correct. Yeah. I, I, I will just uh, we'll we'll sit down uh, the LSU women's basketball team here uh, in 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 a, just a moment. But uh, I would say, Reed, what what do you expect to see? Or uh, if you were an LSU women's basketball fan, what would you like to see? Not only tonight against Virginia Tech but just sort of between now and when conference play opens right around New Year's well, Day. Tonight, I want to see that edge from Angel Reese. I, uh -huh. I want, she, she always attacks the game with a chip on her shoulder. She's always 
um, coming out being super physical and being super aggressive. So I, I want to see that Angel Reese tonight, you know, the one who um, goes after it on the offensive glass and, and um, gets fouled and finishes through contact and, and you know, celebrates and taunting at the bench. You know, you, you want to see that Angel Reese. Mm-hmm. Like you want, you want to see her look like fully herself and, and you want her back with that edge um, that – that she that she you know that she used all season to to dominate everybody and I think going forward you want to see them improve overall defensively because the last time we saw them um, in, in a big ranked matchup was against Colorado and in that game they were really poor defensively they they gave up ninety points they gave up ten plus three pointers and they let Colorado shoot fifty percent from the field last year they didn't let an opponent do those three things in any game all year so I think. Um, if you look at the numbers, um, LSU's defensive rating, I have it right here, um, through through eight games, I believe, um, and, and this is a small sample size, and the Colorado game skews it a lot. Through eight games, they're outside the top 50 um, in the country in defensive rating. Um, a, lot, a lot of that because the Colorado loss is, is weighing it down so much. Um, in comparison, last year, they were in the top 10. They were seventh. Um, so I, I think Kim Mulkey, she she really takes pride in her team's defensive effort. Um, overall commitment to that end of the floor. So against Virginia Tech and, uh, you know, going forward, you want to see them sharpen up defensively and, and you want to see them get back to where they were a season ago where they sort of let um, their def- their defense lead to their offense out in transition um, and, and um, lay the foundation of their team like that. So I'll be looking for that the rest of the speaking, conference. No, yeah, speaking of aggression and just sort of the, you know, the sort of mad dog killer mentality, you mentioned – you know, obviously the Colorado game and watching that game from afar, that was, it was very, very clear. I think to, well, certainly to me, I don't want to speak for anybody else, but it was very, very clear. Colorado wanted a piece of them. Yes. Colorado had something for them and Colorado very much came out with that aggressive. We're going to take it to you mentality. I I don't know if LSU was surprised by that or maybe that just, maybe that was, maybe it was always going to be Colorado's night, but that was, you know, again, that sort of speaks to what you're saying, Reed, which is, oh, wait a minute. Now, this is this is Angel Reese and LSU. They're the ones that were supposed to have that mad dog killer mentality. Mm-hmm. So, uh, no, yeah, you're right. It'll be interesting to see that. It'll be interesting to see that, particularly tonight uh, against a team like Virginia Tech with a strong front court. Uh, this is the LSU Sports Insider Podcast brought to you by the journalists at The Advocate. Noah.com and the Times Picayune. You know where to find all our writers' great work. That's at TheAdvocate.com. Please subscribe. Uh, to do that, you go to theadvocate.com slash subscribe. Uh, get a hold of our newsletter uh, to stay up to date with LSU women's basketball, men's basketball, baseball, gymnastics, football. Big offseason coming up for football. So uh, stay up to date. To do that, you can sign up for our newsletter at theadvocate.com slash LSU newsletter. We are here every Monday and Thursday on all our social channels, uh, specifically our YouTube channel, our uh, LSU Tigers at NOLA.com YouTube channel. Uh, subscribe there. You can catch us live there. And if you don't catch us live, you can catch us after the fact. Uh, we are brought to you today and every day by Champion Wealth Strategies. To learn more, go to Champion Wealth Strategies and plan like a champion today. Uh, and while you're uh, while you're listening to us and while you're consuming this fine podcast, by all means, uh, do a little shopping too. Go to uh, go to store.theadvocate.com and uh, pick up some LSU championship posters for the LSU fan in your life. If you use the coupon code INSIDER, you can get 15% off your purchase. Uh, that's at store.theadvocate.com. So we're going to talk, uh, Wilson, we appreciate you uh, being patient and discussing a li- and even jumping into <laughs> the LSU I was just going to listen to all of it. I, I'm not plugged in like on women's basketball like I am on, on football. No. So I was interested to, to, as a... To kind of get caught up on everything. Yeah, no, but you bring up some fine points, and um, it's, it's <laughs> this is going to be an interesting interesting year, no matter how you slice it. Whether you're uh, very very much in the middle of it or looking uh, from the looking in from the outside. So, uh, but we've got in the meantime, we've got a lot of football to discuss. Uh, we uh, we got into this a little bit uh, in Monday's podcast, but uh, this is going to be an interesting year, uh, an interesting off season from the standpoint of. Uh, LSU is going to have, you know, you're in year three under Brian Kelly. But by the same token, well, you say, well, hey, look, you know, he's building his program brick by brick, and it's getting a little bit better, getting a little bit better. But by the same token, there's there's going to be some some pretty substantial holes uh, at certain positions on this team. Uh, we've already seen the transfer portal heat up pretty pretty strong. LSU has not been uh, has not seen many losses as of midday Thursday. Uh, in the transfer portal and it's not brought anybody in. Of course, it's a little too early for that. But 
Uh, there's speaking of Christmas shopping, there's going to be a lot of shopping <laughs> going on with all these football programs. So, um, you know, t- take us through where you think LSU stands, where we've discussed their most glaring area of need, I think is on the defensive interior. We would all agree on that, but that's not the only, that's not the only position where you just give us a, give us a rundown of the roster and where the most glaring holes are. You think? Sure. First of all, I'd say like, I think LSU fans have, uh, this week has been like oddly quiet. Yes. <laughs> While oddly. news is heating up around the country, LSU's been, I think, very, and you've seen this, um, I think, a good bit under Brian Kelly anyway, and although this has been a small sample size, and also uh, typically in the Scott Woodward era, when like whenever he's kind of making like a big hire, is it's um, quite and rather meticulous about how it's going about things. It doesn't seem like they've um, rushed into decisions mm-hmm. very much, and um, that seems to be the case again here that, um, while we certainly expect there still to be defensive staff changes made, um, Brian Kelly said earlier this week on the Paul Pinebaum show that they were, um, going through the evaluation process. It was a repeat of what he had said post game on Saturday. Right. And it appears that that is still going on. Um, you know, it will, uh, we'll kind of see where that lands. I think if it's not late this week. Um, like you said, at the time of this podcast we're recording, it's 11.15 on Thursday. So let's be very clear. All of a sudden, this could change. Mm-hmm. Oh, hell, it could break loose. Um, but the um, you know maybe late this week, next week, maybe things will start to happen. Certainly in the transfer portal. Right. Things will start to happen next week. The transfer portal opens up Monday, December 4th. You've already seen a lot of players declare their intention to enter the portal. They will actually, in most cases, be able to enter the portal on Monday. If you've had a head coach who's left, you can go ahead and get in there. Um, that's why, like uh, last night, Duke quarterback Riley Leonard entered the portal. He's uh, um, very likely heading to Notre Dame. Um, while we we're recording, uh, DJ Uyagale, at, I hope I pronounced that correctly, uh, DJU at Oregon State, the former Clemson quarterback, um, he entered the portal. You've seen and an exodus of Michigan State players as well. Absolutely. Yep. Uh, with the coaching change, that makes a lot of sense. Same thing with DJU. His coach, Jonathan Smith, had gone to Michigan State uh, to fill that uh, vacancy and Oregon State's in a very strange spot with where they're going to do conference-wise. So right. there's some talented quarterbacks already going onto the market. Um, what LSU is going to attack, though, specifically in the transfer portal, is going to be interesting because philosophically, Brian Kelly's talked a lot about getting away from the portal. He said just this week on the same in the same appearance on the Paul Feinbaum show that first and foremost, the most important thing to them right now is player retention. Mm-hmm. You know, keeping who they already have on their roster on the roster, um, and that makes a lot of sense because the most stable and successful programs in college football right now they aren't so portal reliant as lsu has been the last couple of years you know you're going out and still getting guys um but it isn't and it's certainly at positions of need but it isn't so the base of a program the the overwhelming majority of the roster is coming from uh the high school ranks um and that's what lsu is trying to get to the problem is that it's got some glaring uh, issues that it has to address and it has to address them quickly And it's a very interesting uh, decision between um, being patient with young guys and trying to get in older players who maybe have some more experience. Um, We saw that most glaringly at cornerback this year where LSU brings in four transfers, but this time they're younger and it just didn't really work out, um, especially once Zy Alexander got hurt. And now down the stretch, some of the, these freshmen played pretty well. Yeah. You know, JV and Toviano and Ashton Stamps did a good job. Sage Ryan, who isn't a freshman, you know, he's a third year guy, but finally kind of in the lineup full time. Like he did some solid things uh, in the back half of the season once he'd gotten more experience at cornerback, a position going into this year he had not played at LSU. Um, and so I, I would start, you know, again, like saying to, I've gone on a, a big tangent here, but to get back to your original question, in order to set this all up, I guess, um, you know, what they need on the on the roster, yeah, definitely starts defensive interior because there are, you know, questions still to, to see if LSU is going to be able to, you know, retain Mason Smith. Um, could they even get Makai Wingo back? Mm-hmm. Uh, it'll be interesting because he's a junior, um, draft eligible, who, will have who has off solid stock, but right. yeah, he's coming off an injury and maybe he decides he wants to come back. We'll see. I don't, you know, that's just like a decision that has to be made. Um, right. and, um, if they can go and like Brian Kelly saying, retain people like that, then you don't have to necessarily go in the portal for as many people. We saw them earlier this week, though, get a commitment from Sean Washington. He's a junior college defensive tackle out of Warren Easton in New Orleans, started his career at Georgia, ends up going to East Mississippi community college. And now he's somebody, a, a bigger body on the defensive line who they brought in. Um, you know, they are, uh, according to uh, the recruiting websites, uh, I think on three had this first, Gabe, Gabe Relaford, 
um, is a defensive lineman in this in this class uh, currently committed to Texas A and M, who LSU is going to be able to get on an official visit in December. Um, that's big because. Uh, I think December 1st, I get maybe this weekend, um, you need players, you need high school players, um, especially on the defensive line, in order to not be able to have to deal with an issue of going to the portal every year. So it starts broadly with, with all that, like getting these guys retained so you're not going after into the portal. Um, but to continue to put uh, on this answer, I would start up front with the defensive line. And then um, do we want to go position by position? Well, I was just going to, before we get into that, and I do want to get into that, I would just sort of ask you, and, and I know we've discussed this a little bit on previous podcasts, but uh, you're right. You, you, you don't build a solid foundation and a strong program uh, almost exclusively out of the transfer transfer portal. Matter of fact, you can't. Yeah. Uh, the one exception maybe is Florida State, which has just over and over and over again gotten – excellent use out of players from the transfer portal, usually players who have played more than one year in the transfer portal, which again, uh, back to your point, is something that, that Brian Kelly was trying to do in the secondary this year. He didn't want to have to continually quick fix and get these one-year guys, uh, which you can ap appreciate and respect. That's not really how you want to build a program. By the same token, uh, you're going to have to do some of this, right? Because you can't, uh, are, do you want to, do you want to trust an 18 year old at a, at a, you know, at a, at a position of need to come in and fill, fill in. I mean, it can be done, but it, by the same token, if you've got a need at safety, for example, do you really want to put an 18 year old back there and have him, you know, in a, in a very important position? So, how, you know, I guess, I guess that's the question really is how much can Brian Kelly pull, you know, almost exclusively from the high school ranks versus how much should he, and will he need to, a lot of the transfer portal is going to have to do some of that, right? Oh, he's absolutely going to have to do some of that. And like you said, they don't, he acknowledged in that answer this week that they still were going to have to use the portal in, in spots. They don't want it to be like the main thing for this program moving forward. But you look at safety, I think, is a, is a great example in particular. Whereas, like LSU, say in the best case scenario, they can retain Mason Smith and Makai Wingo and Jacobin Guillory. Maybe you don't need to go add a ton of transfer defensive tackles. Like, the, you know, shown as a Juco, that's a little mm -hmm. bit different than what we've seen now in the portal. So maybe, but you do probably need a safety, um, if not two, um, just because you've got some young guys that they like, like, um, you know, Ryan Yates got some playing time this year. Jordan, Jordan Allen. Allen got some playing time near the end of the season. Um, you're bringing in a guy like Deshaun McBride, who's currently the highest ranked player in this class, according to 24-7's uh, composite. But like you're saying, do you want those guys to be your starters? Are they ready to be your starters? Um, if LSU decides that they are, then, then you know, we'll see. But that's a – it would be better, I think, if they had the competition – that could play out between those guys in some older transfers in order to decide, okay, who is the best and not just have to try to figure out at safety, you know, who are they going to go with um, out of the, out of a group of very young players. Um, another one that uh, I think they could use an older guy. They've already, because if this one's a little bit different because they've recruited extremely well at wide receiver, but again, even if you're able to bring back Kyron Lacey and have that retention element, you, are still lacking um, someone on that in that wide receiver core who is like really established as like a 500 plus yard receiver. You like, have a lot oh, of Kyron returning has, players, yeah. but not a lot of them are experienced necessarily. Exactly, as experienced as Kyron like. would be your most experienced, and he's gone for what is it this season? 463 yards and seven touchdowns. Like he's had a very solid year, um, but he hasn't been like what well, Malik was last year as an 1,000 yard receiver. Then again, that's that is hard to come by, but still, you know. If you were able to get another older person in there with him and Chris Hilton and Aaron Anderson and these group of current freshmen like Shelton Sampson and Kyle Parker and Jalen Brown and and then the other freshmen that you've got coming in, then you've at least got some experience there that you can maybe turn to. Um, it's got to be someone that they like, of course, in the portal at any point. And that's another thing about the portal this year. LSU's got to do a better job in its evaluations yeah. overall. Yes. Um, because... There was multiple guys who just didn't really pan out that they thought were going to be major contributors this season. And um, I think there was a multi-layer issue with, um, you know, someone like Omar Spates might be the best example mm -hmm. of this. And this isn't to knock Omar, but it didn't seem like maybe he was always being used in the correct way. And then he also wasn't healthy for like half the season, but it just wasn't the year that um, LSU was maybe expecting um, from somebody who was brought in to be the middle linebacker. And so... 
um, they got to, you know, make sure whoever it is they are bringing in is going to fit what they're doing schematically and that what they're schematically is going to fit what the strengths of the players are. Um, and that they are going to have, you know, the proper, they need to get a lot more speed on defense. That's another thing, regardless of the position, they need more team speed on defense. And I think, I think it's also important to point out the positions maybe that LSU doesn't need to address in the portal mm-hmm. offensive line, maybe mm-hmm. quarterback, mm-hmm. maybe that's an interesting discussion. It, but, quarterback yeah. is an interesting discussion, but you'd imagine they feel good about Garrett Nussmeyer, mm-hmm. um, with Jane Daniels leaving. So they don't necessarily need to attack the portal. Um, at the quarterback position, um, even you know, like they did when they brought in Jaden Daniels. So I think if you, if you have those two positions locked up, those are two really important position groups that can be the foundation of your team. And so I think um, if if you look at those two, you say, all right, we got a really good foundation here on at least on the offensive side of the ball. And so maybe we go to the portal to add a couple guys to build on top of that, you know, and you know, make that foundation even better. Yeah, and. The offensive line is particularly interesting because they've recruited well. They probably don't need to, but that's another area of like a retention spot. Like yes. if they yes. can get Garrett Dellinger back yes. and Miles Frazier back, and you have four of your five starters returning. Charles offensive Turner line. has an extra year of eligibility. He does have an extra year. Okay, I thought he was, might have been done, but okay, then if you he can does. get all three of those guys back, then yep. bring back your entire offensive line, then you're in fantastic shape. Huge. My God, and um, it's and it's a great point to build on there. The court so. Quarterback discussion is interesting. Rab and I have talked about this a little bit, Reed. Rab thinks that they have to get a transfer portal quarterback to be the starter. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't agree with him on I that. Think Where do you stand? To, to defend Rab for a sec, I think he just wants like a competition. I don't, I don't, know, if he, <laughs> I don't know if he's like, we, we, can't, do, we can't trust Nuss. I think, he, I think he wants to bring in a guy for a competition. I think he could do a whole lot worse than Garrett Nussmeyer. He's been in the program a long time. He's waited for his turn. He's developed behind Jaden Daniels. Um, he's got... A lot of arm talent, a lot of raw talent, and I think, um, you know, over that time, you can probably see him sort of harness that talent and then become a more a smarter, more polished quarterback. And on top of that, again, he's not Jaden. He won't be Jaden. It's unfair to hold him to that standard. Um, but he's he's got a little mobility too. He he he's not he's not going to break off eighty five yard runs like Jaden did. But you know, he he's mobile. He can use his legs to escape the pocket, and he has that a little bit element to his game as well so i think he's got a lot of potential he could do a whole lot worse than him um in the sec and i think it speaks volumes that he's stuck around for a while and the coaching staff has uh, stuck with him and, and kept him in what's interesting is because I, I agree with you on garrett like I, I think he's going to be a solid starter especially if he continues to develop in the ways that you can over an entire off season especially of one where you think you're going to be the guy mm-hmm. and yet Imagine there was like the Missouri game this year. Obviously, Jaden wasn't out for very long, but like Garrett had to go in there and um, the Alabama game that Garrett had to finish off because of Jaden's concussion. Um, Georgia game last year. Exactly. There are moments when sometimes you are going to need your backup. Right. Does LSU get a transfer portal quarterback for that kind of scenario? Good that point. was what I think would be interesting. Mm-hmm. Somebody who you can bring in to compete with Garrett and you know let the best man win, but also then maybe have like somebody, some in, more insurance, just because, again, Ricky Collins, a freshman this year, did not play. Do you get, is, is he ready to be someone, your number two? Correct. Same thing, Colin Hurley is a guy coming in. He reclassified. He's going to be very young. Mm-hmm. Um, a guy with quite a bit of uh, arm talent that you would like to be able to probably develop for at least a year or two um, before he's really needing to be thrown into the fire. That's where I think the decision becomes very interesting for LSU is, do you bring in somebody, at least for some insurance and some proven depth at quarterback, but not somebody who is maybe going to uh, unseat Garrett? Because then you run the risk of losing Garrett. Right, <laughs> right. And then you're back in the same position of maybe not yes. having proven depth. So it's going to be an interesting decision that LSU has to make there on the offensive side of quarterback. At the same time, a couple of years ago, if they said, okay, we're good with Miles Brennan, we're good with Garrett Nussmeyer, you don't get Jaden Daniels out of the portal and then none of this happens this season. So it, it's a difficult balancing act. I'm not jealous of Brian Kelly and his staff for having these problems to deal with, but it's why they're well compensated to deal <laughs> yeah. with the problems. Exactly. There, was, there was one other uh, position I did want to hit on, uh, just because I think the uniqueness of where they were versus where they're going to be, and that's the running back position. You know, Famously, eight scholarship running backs going into, going into camp this year. Logan Diggs very much asserts himself as the number one running back. Obviously, Jaden was the leading rusher, but uh, 
Well, I'll, I'll I'll let you give your insight on this, Wilson. We suspect that maybe Logan Diggs has played his last down, or certainly the bowl game might be his last. You know, might be his last game at LSU. We don't know. The same could be true for Josh Williams. Could be true for uh, Noah Kane. Caleb Jackson. Obviously, you like what you see in Caleb Jackson. Brian Kelly has said many times that he's very sort of green as a football player. Uh, so, you know, you go from a scholarship running backs to, well, how many do you have? And is there a lead back and so on and so forth? What just sort of discuss the, the state of the running back position. Do they need to go find yet another one someplace else? We'll see. It kind of depends on who, again, this retention <laughs> element, like who they're mm-hmm. able to bring back. Um, because, you know, if you could bring back Logan Diggs, that's then enormous. you don't need to at all. Right. <laughs> that's a huge, huge thing. Um, and, and Logan, you know, didn't play as much down the stretch. Um, he was obviously, you know, hurt and missed a couple of games. Um, and then, you know, he did come back against A&M, but he only had five carries. Mm-hmm. And um, then again, it was just the Jaden Daniels show anyway. And that's just, that's a really hard Texas A&M front to try to run on. Um, but anywho, Logan, you know, it's someone who is a junior who's got pretty much two full years of tape already. And that running back position, as we know, it's usually better for those guys to kind of get onto the NFL because they take such a, there's so much wear and tear and and all that. And it's usually, if you're able to, after year three, it's usually a good decision to go, but if else he was able to get him back, then that would be absolutely uh, enormous. If, if he does go onto the NFL, then you're looking at a really interesting room because, you know, Caleb, like you said, had some uh, moments where you could see his inexperience this year. But also, so all what he's capable oh, of. Yeah. And mm-hmm. if they can fully bring that out of him, Frank Wilson can sort of smooth out the edges of his game, then he's your, looks like your lead back. You, yeah, you may be and, sad. And you're probably okay there, especially because LSU's bringing in Caden Durham, um, mm-hmm. who's uh, a four star out of Duncanville in Texas. Um, and then next year, in 2025, this is like way, way projecting, but you've got uh, a couple studs here in Louisiana, Harlan Berry in particular, I think, um, who uh, at the running back position. But anyway, for next season, there's two names that are going to be particularly fascinating to kind of see what happens because it might determine what else you have to do with transfer in the transfer portal, if anything, is Noah Kane and Josh Williams. Uh-huh. Um, they both have another year of eligibility. Right. Um, because of, you know, uh, injuries or the COVID year injuries, COVID year, um, red shirts earlier in their careers, things like that. And so, um, if LSU can get one of them back, at least one of them back, I, I would anticipate, you know, some other departures from this room simply because guys want playing time. I mm-hmm. mean, especially with Josh and Noah's case, and I wouldn't knock them for this. If they do decide to no, do this, and we don't, be the and I'm not, this is pure else, speculation, but they yeah. got one, both of them have one year left. Sure. If you're trying to, you know, put more on, on tape and you don't know if you're going to be the lead guy, like that would make some sense. Um, and I wouldn't fault them for that at all. If that's what they wanted to do. Um, and all these decisions again are like kind of being, um, made here now and over the next couple of weeks as the portal opens up. Um, from December 4th until January 3rd. It's a 30-day period. So I think those are the two most interesting things to look at. I mean, it starts with Diggs, if you can retain him or not. If he goes on to the NFL, then Williams or Kane, uh, which one, if, if not both, can you keep? Because if you can keep one of those guys, say say just for, uh, um, you know, in a hypothetical scenario, you can and keep Josh Williams. John Emery's eligibility is up. He's, he's gone. Um, Caleb Jackson, Trey Holly. Um, and Caden Durham as your top four, then you know maybe Trey Bradford's there as like a fifth for some depth or something like that. Like that's a solid no, room. Suddenly you feel I don't know good. if you really need a transfer right. in that scenario, especially if Caleb's ready to be your RB RB one with Josh like next to him or something like that as a compliment for some senior uh, you know senior in there who's like such a great pass blocker. Right. I don't know if you necessarily need one. Right. We will. Uh, so before before we get out of here, we obviously have to uh, discuss uh, one of the topics du jour that we have not discussed yet, which is Jaden Daniels' pursuit of the Heisman. But we know that there's nothing left for him to be able to do. There's nothing left that he can do. He's in the clubhouse, as they say. Uh, the the lines have moved a little bit. Uh, the numbers have moved a little bit. Uh, the odds makers now have Bo Nix as my, at minus two hundred to win the Heisman. Jaden Daniels plus one fifty. Michael Penix. Plus eighteen hundred. The Pac-12 championship game is tomorrow. It's Friday night in Las Vegas between Oregon and Washington. We know there's nothing Jaden Daniels can do but watch and hope for sort of a favorable outcome, uh, for lack of a better way to put it. Uh, I I 
happen to think that there's still a possibility that even though Penix is far behind as far as the odds makers uh, are concerned, I, I don't think I don't think it will happen, but I think it's certainly possible that he could, you know, six touchdowns and 500 yards passing or something like that. Well, now we got another. Now we're going to have to have another debate about whether he's done enough to get himself back toward the top. Uh, but for now, we think that it's Bo, Bo Nix and Jaden Daniels. Uh, and so I'll put this question to you. If, you, if you're in Bo Nix's shoes, uh, what's more important? I'll put this to you, Reed, first. Uh, mm -hmm. What's more important in terms of let's forget about, you know, what your team goals are in terms of winning the conference and so on and so forth. Uh, is it more important for Bo Nix to win the game, to defeat Washington and get yourself into the get yourself a Pac-12 championship, get into the playoff? Or is it more important to play well, win or lose? Or, or is it, you know, if he plays well in a loss, is that still enough? I don't think if he plays well in a, in a loss, I, I don't think that's enough. Because what, what he really has going for them is Oregon is so good and he has them in position for a college football playoff. Numbers-wise, I don't think you could make an argument um, Bo Nix over Jaden Daniels. So I think, you know, a lot of voters, they just want to vote for a guy who's got a shot at the playoff as opposed to Jaden, who's not even playing for a conference championship. So I think, yeah, you have to win minimum. And if you put up huge numbers on top of that, great. Then, then we might see him become the favorite. I just think it's kind of funny that, I don't know if we've ever mentioned this, Bo Nix, you know, he, he left the SEC, he transferred out, but he's still like a thorn in LSU fans. <laughs> you know, all, all these years later. So it's it, it seems like it's going to come down to, um, Bo Nix versus Jaden Daniels, I guess. And Penix, if, if, if he has a big game and they win, he guess he'll slide back in. But um, I guess I guess we'll find out exactly Friday night uh, exactly what Jaden's looking like over the next week or so. That is hilarious that two years ago in Tiger Stadium, Bo Nix is scrambling and just like <laughs> doing all sorts of things that don't really make a whole lot of sense, but Auburn wins anyway. Yeah. <laughs> and then the series maybe going to win the Hots. Uh, <laughs> That's a great point. I, I, I would agree though with Reed that it's, that Oregon really has to win because if he has the argument of a Pac-12 champion that is going to the college football playoff, a one loss team, then there are, it's, he's going to have a, he's, he'll probably still have be the odds on favorite consistent, consensusly going into that last day of voting on Monday. Um, and that would be hard for Jaden to overcome. Even with everything he's done statistically, people might just not look past that, or they might just simply look at the passing stats, which, Bo uh, has more uh, passing yards than Jaden, even though he doesn't have more passing touchdowns at this point. And his completion percentage is uh, extremely high. I think he's on pace right now to set the NCAA he's record. Best in the nation. And yeah. um, so those sorts of things would be very much working in his favor for people, uh, especially those who maybe aren't looking at all of the advanced analytics or by even the same notion of something that's very basic, taking into account what Jaden has done with his legs. Is uh, So let's let's flip this thing around and give you another scenario. If Oregon wins, but Bo Nix only, air quotes, only throws for 220 yards, two touchdowns, and two interceptions, is that enough to get him the Heisman? Or is, is that enough for Jaden to sort of sneak in through, through the back door and win it? I think Jaden would win it in that scenario, maybe. I, I mean, I, I that's the too. last impression. Mm -hmm. And it's such a ra feels like such a razor-thin margin right now, and people kind of on the fence whether or not to go one way or another. If Bo Nix's last impression, we we talk so much about how Jaden doesn't have another case to make right. for the Heisman. If Bo, in his last case uh, for this award, has probably what probably would be his worst game of the season, then I think people would be like, okay, well, I'm not going to vote for him. I, I think that's yes. I think that's fair too. Uh, yeah. I, I totally agree with you there. But on the flip side, he has a huge game, and if Oregon wins. But, you know, it, that's that, the that it could be very well game set match yep. because, again, recency bias is real. And to be fair, he's had a great season. Um, you know, his numbers don't match, particularly when you bring in the rushing stats. They don't necessarily match Jaden Daniels. But, uh, you know, to to have a great season to finish with the highest completing completion percentage in the nation and then to take your team to the college football, football playoff and go, what would that be? I guess 12 and one. Mm -hmm. uh, that's that's significant, and it will have been the most recent thing that the that the Heisman voters will have seen. So uh, this is going to be a big weekend here. We're we're going to kick it off here early. Uh, we will tip it off uh, here early uh, at 8 p.m. Thursday with the LSU women's basketball team going uh, going up against Virginia Tech. That ought to be uh, well. Get your popcorn ready, as Terrell Owens used to say. It'll be uh, it'll be quite a show. That will uh, that will start it off, and then we will have one last weekend of. 
Uh, well, it's certainly not a full weekend of college football, but certainly one of the most significant weekends of the college football season. We will all be uh, tuning in, I'm sure, on Friday night to see what Bo Nix and Michael Penix do and whether that has a, uh, a negative effect or a positive effect on Jaden Daniels' Heisman uh, campaign. We will be here uh, for it all. We will be back here on Monday to discuss it all and to see where everything stands uh, with the LSU women, with the LSU football team, with Jaden, and uh, everything else that uh, that may be coming down the road. We are here every Monday and Thursday uh, on all our social channels, specifically our YouTube channel. Uh, that's LSU Tigers at NOLA.com on YouTube. Uh, please subscribe, and uh, you can either catch us live or you can catch us after the fact. We are on Apple Podcasts. Spotify, wherever the finer podcasts are found. Uh, and uh, to stay up to date, obviously, get a hold of our LSU newsletter. To do that, you sign up at theadvocate.com slash LSU newsletter uh, and subscribe. Subscribe to The Advocate if you haven't already, whether that's our digital edition or our print edition. You do that at theadvocate.com slash subscribe. Uh, again, we as we discussed, uh, real tree or fake tree, that's very important. Uh -huh. It can lead to uh, all-out brawls, and we're going to get in the octagon here, the three of us, and <laughs> figure it out as soon as we uh, finish taping. Uh, I am team fake tree, as weird as that sounds, but one way or the other, this is holiday Awful. season, and uh, it's gift-giving season, so uh, for the LSU fan in your life, listen, these these Advocate Championship posters, front page posters, uh, have been iconic, and they have been for 30-odd years now. Uh, you can uh, do some holiday shopping at store.theadvocate.com. Again, that's store.theadvocate.com. And uh, put in the coupon code INSIDER. You get 15% off your purchase. We are brought to you today and every day also by Champion Wealth Strategies. Uh, to learn more about them, you go to championwealthstrategies.com. We certainly appreciate them being aboard. Uh, contact Champion Wealth Strategies and plan like a champion today. Gentlemen, it's been a pleasure. We, uh, I guess, we'll have to discuss Christmas playlists and uh, what the, you know, the best holiday food is and stuff like that. But uh, we will save that for another day. For Reed Darcy, for Wilson Alexander, and for Robert Young behind the glass. This is uh, my name is Perrin Keys. Uh, this has been the LSU Sports Insider.